Welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm Kathleen Walter. A new White House review of the war strategy in Afghanistan is out. Mideast expert and Newsmax contributor Dr. Walid Faraz joins us to talk about that and his new book, The Coming Revolution, a Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East. Dr. Faraz is also a Fox News analyst and an advisor to the House of Representatives. Welcome back to Newsmax TV, Dr. Faraz. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for having me today. Nice to have you in studio for a change. Absolutely. Well, in the wake of the war report, President Obama says that he's not going to make any major changes to the war strategies in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The White House review indicates that the U.S. troops can start withdrawing in July and that we can hand over security responsibility to the Afghans by 2014. What is your reaction to these findings? Well, there are two points, Kathleen. Number one, the president said we're not going to make any significant change to the strategy. And number two, we're going to withdraw anyway in 2011, mm -hmm. which means so far if we don't make a strategy, we are not defeating the Taliban. We are not enabling Afghani society. So what the president is basically telling us is that as far as we have a situation in Afghanistan today, we're going to have it the day we're going to withdraw, which means the Taliban won't be defeated. That's what I understand. Now, there seems to be conflicting reports on the progress in Afghanistan. The White House review paints a more optimistic view of the war efforts in the region, um, much more optimistic than the national intelligence estimates, which showed that Taliban attacks on our troops have, have actually gone up in the past year. Which assessment, in your view, is more accurate? Well, look, on the ground, the national intelligence assessment is only, you know, describing what is happening, meaning the Taliban continue to attack. Right. A real assessment is going to be, will the Afghani government and Afghani society, after our withdrawal, be able to defeat the Taliban and roll them back? If with our forces they're not able, what will be the case after our withdrawal? I mean, any... Uh, expert will tell you that the Taliban will be on the counteroffensive. What we have missed in this war and in this policy under this administration as well is the fact that we have not engaged with real civil society forces in Afghanistan. Is this a winnable war in your view? General Petraeus says he's not so uh, optimistic that this war can be won by 2014, say. Without really engaging in mobilizing the next generation of young Afghanis, those who were 10 in 2001 are 18 and 19 and, and 20 one in the next few years, these should have been the generation that we should have educated, mobilized, and helped to defeat the Taliban. If we withdraw in 2011, without that societal change in Afghanistan, Afghanistan will be ruled again by either chaos or the Taliban. Now, in your book, you emphasize that the free world can win the conflict with the jihadists, but not by using the policies and strategies that it has used so far. What must President Obama do for the U.S. to win not only the war, but also the war on terror? Two different things. These are two different things. We are familiar with the map of the terror forces in the Middle East. You have the jihadi, Salafi, Al-Qaeda, Taliban on the one hand, and then you have the Iranian regime and the other humanist uh, organizations such as Hezbollah. What this administration has missed in describing to the American public and the international community is the map of social forces, the democracy forces, who are the only insurance policy we have to defeat the, the jihadists. So what the administration should do is engaged not with the Taliban and the Muslim Brotherhood and these organizations, but women, students, artists, cab drivers, civil society forces in the same way. We've recognized them in Eastern Europe before the collapse of the Soviet Union. You also argue in the book that a race for control over the Middle East is on, pitting those who want to bring all countries from Morocco to Afghanistan under what the Islamists call a caliphate against those who are trying to stop it. Do you see the U.S. and the West retreating? I see the West retreating under this administration. I hope the next Congress is going to be sitting down with the administration and trying to forge a better policy, otherwise a next administration. Uh, what we have in the Middle East is indeed a race, I call it in Middle Earth, between the forces of jihadism across the board and these civil society uprisings. 1.5 million people in the streets of Tehran uh, last year, that is a revolution. 1.5 million people in the streets of Beirut, that's the Cedars Revolution. And across the board, we see spasms of people who wants to counter the jihadists. What we don't see is a policy in Washington, D.C. to support them. Now, you touched on Iran. We learned this week that Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak compared Iran's growing influence in the Middle East to a cancer. It continues developing its nuclear program. Do you think that the U.S. should be taking a harder line approach with Iran? Well, the description by President Mubarak is somewhat strategically accurate. The Iranian regime is meddling in Iraq through its militias. 
has Hezbollah, which is now making progress into the control of Lebanon, is ally with the regime, the genocidal regime of Sudan, has a presence in northern uh, Yemen, and across the board, the Iranian regime is trying to expand at the expense of not just the United States' interests, but all of its allies, and certainly against democracy. What the United States should do is have a policy on Iran. As far as we can see right now, we have a withdrawal, disengagement policy from countering Iran. Should the military option remain on the table? The military option is always on the table as long as we see the launching of these hundreds and hundreds of missiles that the Iranian regime is showing us, of course, uh, and as long as the Iranian regime is sending up to $1 billion to Hezbollah in Lebanon and arming the uh, insurgencies from Yemen to, to Iraq, certainly we should have that option on the table. What we should have is the option of allying ourselves with the Iranian people against the Iranian regime. That's what we should do. And how would, you, how would we go about doing that? Well, absolutely, you have the NGOs. We saw them in action. 60% of the 1.5 million people who demonstrated in Tehran were women. What's our policy vis-a-vis -vis Iranian women? Uh, a majority of them were under the age of 18. What's our broadcast towards these people? And there is a beautiful, great Iranian diaspora that we should engage with. We have all the tools at our disposal. What we don't have is a policy. Do you think a military strike is inevitable? Do you see that happening? And if so, who, who, who would strike? Do you suspect it would be Israel? And, or would it be the U.S.? Would the U.S. be more willing with this new Congress, perhaps, to support a strike by Israel? Uh, Kathleen, Israel has a different clock from the United States because one strike by the Iranians against the Israelis, and that will be a, a, a life-threatening strike against the, that nation. Uh, so that is something that the Israelis will have to decide, but in coordination with the United States and Washington, D.C., both the administration and Congress will have really to come together and decide if the Iranian regime is going to produce a nuclear bomb, they already have the missiles, then all possibilities are here. And if the Iranians are going to basically continue with the military engagement in the region, they will be inviting it, not the West. What about al-Qaeda? There are reports that al-Qaeda is plotting attacks for uh, around Christmas time against U.S., Great Britain, and at least one other European country. Is this a sign that al-Qaeda is reorganizing and rebounding and ramping up its assault against Western interests? Absolutely. The, the, the other missed analysis in Washington and in Brussels, the capital of the European Union, is that al-Qaeda has now created a second generation of jihadists. We're not dealing anymore with the Muhammad Atta Ziyad al-Jarrah type of the 19 who attacked us on 9-11. We're dealing with people who are born in the West, in America, and in, in Western Europe, people who have converted. I mean, we're talking about uh, from the shoe bomber to the jihad James. This is a different generation of people, and yes, they are adamant and uh, determined to attack liberal democracies both in Europe and in the United States, and they are known to be very symbolical. So Christmas, holidays, this is what they would like to do. Hopefully, we'll be able to contain that. Now, on a separate but related issue, the Senate is taking up START, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, this week. Can you explain what is at stake here and whether you think that START should be dealt with now or in the new Congress? Well, it is always better that the new Congress will deal with these issues because the new Congress basically represents the concerns, the aspiration of the American majority. Now, the new Congress, certainly, as we can see, is very tough on the issue of defense, and they should be and they should link the relationship with Russia, China, everybody else in the region in relationship to our containment and war against the terrorists. Former President Bush has taken a lot of heat for referring to some of those countries that you just mentioned as the axis of evil. Was he correct in identifying those nations as such? Well, President Bush did not invent it. Actually, the peoples of these regimes call them evil. That's what the Iranian opposition said about their own regime. That's what the people in Sudan said about the genocidal regime, so on and so forth. I mean, a regime in Syria that massacres its own population, how would you qualify that? So the president only described what has been already described by the people of these regimes. Dr. Ferris, my last question for you is on your book because it is such a fascinating read. What surprises will readers find? And if there's any one message that you have for readers, what would it be? Our readers and future readers will have to, you know, have the actual surprise of learning that in that huge Middle East from Morocco to China, you have on the one hand forces of jihadism like Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, uh, the Taliban, Shabab in Somalia, every day we see a new emerging jihadi force, and that's very depressing. The good news I'm bringing in that book, and the hope I'm bringing to the reader, is that out there, there are a majority of women, 
and youth and minorities, just peaceful people who really want and are determined to struggle. What they need is not just our support, it's our recognition that we would tell them the same way we addressed Lesz Walesa in Poland, Václav Havel in uh, Czechoslovakia at the time, and all the dissidents. We're with you morally. The book is called The Coming Revolution. Dr. Walid Ferris, I want to congratulate you on the book. It's available in bookstores and online. If folks want to find out more about you, where can they go? The easiest way, if they can spell my name, walidferris.com, W-A-L-I-D-P-H-A-R-E-S.com, and then from there to all the websites that are for the books. Dr. Ferris, thanks so much. It's always great to see you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for stopping by. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.